It has been so amazing to see what you guys have made for my Raycaster tutorials. I love your additions like smooth movement and strafing around the level, implementing weapons and projectiles, using different programming languages, porting this to retro devices like the old Zune, and I love seeing this small touchscreen display, and even adding your own style and color palette with different kinds of enemies and weapons. Ah, oh, and this one, I love this floppy disk prop. You took the Raycaster tutorial to make a demake, and now it's just really cool to see this kind of style. And I love this edition where you made a portal or a door that leads to another level, another room to explore. I like seeing the animated textures on the walls and transparent sprites and moving doors. And thank you again for all the comments and support for wanting to see a part four. It, this has just been so cool to see. And I like that you let me know what you want to see in part 4, and I think it would be a great idea to make a map a level editor so we can quickly design and edit our own levels and then play it in real time. So this video will be able to move the players around, add the walls, add the floors, add the ceilings. You can add multiple enemies. You're welcome to follow along in OpenGL and C, or translate it to your own program that you're coding in, or feel free to download the link just to play it and have fun. But of course I promote watching the whole video so that way you can see the code and understand how it works, so then you can edit to add even more fun features. So let's compile the code and see where we left off in part 3. The title screen will fade up from black. You can't open the doors until you collect the key. Uh, behind the door is an enemy. The enemy will always try to track you down and kill you. It will uh, slide against walls. Then of course you can open the door, exit to end the level, and you won. So I'm just going to go ahead and minimize these functions because we don't really need to see all of them at the same time. So I'm just going to open the ones that we need whenever we need it. So we're using a variable called GameState, and if we jump down to the display function, we can see how it's being used. If the variable GameState is 0 or above, that is our game, so let's check if GameState is negative, then we can show our map editor. We'll put the whole game in an else statement, so we're either going to be in the 2D level editor or the 3D game. And we haven't actually made this function yet, so let's go ahead and create it. And let's first just clear the background color with a double for loop. And we're drawing extra large pixels that are 8 units thick, so there's only 80 by 20. I'm going to give it kind of a bright bluish color. And our pixels are 8 times larger, so we multiply by 8. And this is a refresher from the first three parts of the tutorial. So remember game state has to be negative for us to view it. And remember we need to draw our pixels much larger. So with OpenGL we can use GL point size, set it to 8. It looks good, it did clear the background, but the way OpenGL draws the points, it's in the center, so we have to offset by half the units. So we can fix this by shifting the pixels over by half of our pixel unit, which would just be 4, which is a correction that we can make in our draw raise function too. So every time we're drawing a vertex, either for the walls, or the floor, the ceiling, and even the sky, we can shift them all over, half a unit of 4, and in the screens like the title screen, wind screen, loose screen. Alright, just gonna minimize and compile. Looks good to me, I don't see any edges, so we're good to go. Let's have a variable to keep track of which map we're looking at. Are we looking at the walls, the floors, or the ceiling? And what current texture are we going to be using? Alright, back to our map editor. We cleared the background. Next I want to draw our array so we can see the level. And if our current map is 0, then we pass the wall array. 1 will draw the floors, 2 will draw the ceiling, and if we're ever not on the wall array, let's still draw the walls but have them black so we know where they are. You'll see how helpful this is in a minute. And then we need to display or draw that current texture so we know which texture we're actually going to apply next. So here's that function to draw the squares from the array, very similar to what we did in our previous tutorials, but we read the value from the array times by the dimension of the texture, save that pixel's red, green, and blue value, 0 to 255, and we'll have a variable to check if we want to draw the black walls, we simply clear the RGB values to 0. Our draw current texture will be similar, a 16 by 16 pixel display. We'll position it with an X and Y offset up in the right corner. And let's compile and see what it looks like. Alright, not too bad, we can see our current texture in the corner. We still have some updates to do. All of our textures are 32 pixels wide, so to scale it down to 16 we need to multiply by 2. And this is temporary, but I'm going to subtract 1 from our array value. This is because we were using 0 as a texture, now it's going to be empty, so this is a temporary correction. Compile, and there we go. Our current texture looks good. Scale down by 2. Aha, and there are the correct textures. I recognize those two doors and the windscreen. 
So those are the walls. Next, I want to be able to see the player's location. I'm going to give it a green value. So this formula will convert our player position, divide by 64 world units to get us in the array, times by 6 units wide, which is what we're drawing, by 8, which is our pixel scale. And hopefully if we compile, we'll see the player. Yes, he is in the correct position. I also want to see the direction that he's looking. So we can just copy this and add our players delta x and delta y. So now we have the vector of where he's looking. We'll make it a darker green. So we drew the player, let's draw the sprites, so that's the keys and the enemy. We'll create number of sprites as a global variable to define that later. And we'll have an RGB value within the struct of each sprite. So we'll go ahead and define that variable globally. And then we'll add the RGB value within the struct sprite. And we'll give it a few more so we don't clip the array. And down in the initialize function, I want to simplify the variables. So this RGB value is just for the 2D editor. Uh, my key is going to be red and the enemy will be yellow. And looks good. We can see the red key and the yellow enemy behind the door, just like how I remembered it in 3D. So along with the code, we had a folder full of textures. I went over this in part two and three. And let's create a texture for our UI buttons. Uh, 16 pixels wide, 64 tall. Each button is eight pixels tall. And I'm gonna wanna save and load. I wanna rotate the player. I want a button to add enemies. I want a button to view the walls, or the floors, or the ceiling, and then I want to play the game. And just a quick refresher, I'm using the free program GIMP. We want to save as a .ppm, and then save as ASCII. So then you can open that in Notepad, and replace all the spaces, or dollar sign with a comma. And then replace the first four lines of code with your array name. You have an open bracket, and at the end we close it. So let's go ahead and include that array. And then we can draw those buttons using a double for loop, set to the image dimensions, offset about 104 units, that'll put it on the side. And we're off to a good start, we can draw our current texture, our UI buttons. I'm going to use OpenGL to create some mouse input. We'll start with a global variable called button state. So button state is going to be set to which button we clicked on. If that button is being drawn, then we set the red value to zero. So visually we can see the button is pressed down because it's more blue. And this is the kind of function OpenGL needs to check for mouse input. So let's include the standard header file so we can use the printf function. So let's pass the x and y variables into the printf statement. Now this mouse function won't work unless we call it in the main function. So underneath the initialize function, we'll add glute mouse function, and then mouse the name of the function that we just created. So you can see on the console to the left, every time I click it prints the x and y value. Okay, now we know the mouse is working, so let's go ahead and update our function. We only want to check this if statement if we're clicking above 104 units, which means over our UI buttons. And then we can check the Y range for this first button. If button state is greater than 0, set it to 0, and if it's already 0, set it to 1. So let's check if the mouse button is ever up, we will set the button state back to 0. And there we go, every time we click it, we see it print the word save. Each button is 8 units tall, so let's just check each one down the row. We can save, load, rotate the player, add an enemy, view the walls, view the floors, view the ceiling, play the game. All right, we got all of our buttons. Well, they don't do anything yet, but at least we know that they're there. Next, I want to be able to drag the items, so let's have a global variable. And in our mouse function, I want to drag using the right button, so we'll create a similar function to do that. And similar to how we converted the player's position onto the screen, we can reverse it to get the screen position in the world. And then we can check if that mouse position is within 10 units of the X and Y position of the player. Let's set the drag item variable to 1. And we could have several sprites on screen, so we'll have a for loop to cycle through all of them. I'm adding 10 to the drag items just to offset it away from that player selection. And then if the right button is up, drag items equals 0. So this mouse function only runs when you first click down. So for OpenGL, we need a different kind of function to check if the mouse is moving. We set the player position to the dragged X position. If it's larger, then drag item was set to that array value, plus 10, so let's subtract 10 to get the correct value. We did that to skip over the player. And similar to the mouse function that we added in the main function, we need to do the same for the mouse moving function. So the first if statements told us which button is selected. Now we'll make the buttons actually do something. For instance, to rotate the player, which we've done before, we add 45. If we go above 360, reset. Use sine and cosine to set the player direction. So current map is set to either view the walls, floor, ceiling, and then game state to zero will just start the game. And our map editor is going to set our own variables, so we don't need to call the initialize function. 
Alright, fingers crossed that we can drag these items around. Right click to move the player, rotate him, move the key, move the enemy. Let's play this, see how this looks. Uh, our enemy though, he's not really going after us much. Let's take a look at his function and our draw sprites. Yeah, that's what I thought. Previously we knew the exact sprite number, but this time we're going to have to actually cycle through the number of sprites because we could have multiple enemies. We'll exit if it's not an enemy. If it is, then we can check if it kills our player. I want to add a little randomness to each of the players. If there are multiple on screen, they all have a little bit of their unique movements, which I'm adding that small random offset to the sprite's X and Y position. All right, so let's try this again. We'll set it up the way we had it. Oh, yep, there he is. He's after me. Let's get the key. And yep, he's following me. And let's see, he does have the ability to kill me. Yep, he does. All right, so it's working. Now we definitely want to add more textures. I went ahead and drew an empty texture. I have 20 textures, some I created, some I found online that were free to use. And the last texture is important. I drew it to stand out, because that'll end our level. And I did the same process to make the bitmap into the array. And we were a pound of finding the map X and Y, but we needed it to be an integer so we can actually update it each time. We're going to make our own map so we don't need to predefine them, but we'll define the map size since 17 by 13, which is about the max size we can display on the screen as of right now. So let's see, in the initialize function, we don't need to predefine the doors. So right now our arrays are just blank, but we do need to draw a wall perimeter. So I'm going to use a double for loop to cycle through the array and just draw a wall if it's on the edge. Then you can set the floor and ceiling to any default value texture that you want. And let's go ahead and set the map X to 17. And I want to show you a small error coming up. We set the map X value to 17. It's fine, but if you look too far, we end up with this error. Easy to fix. So as we're drawing our arrays, we were limiting the depth of field to 8. That's just too short. Let's set it to something like 20. And let's see if this fixes it. And yep, there you go. We have a much longer draw distance. So we can see the walls. And we can see this guy right here. He wants to say hi. Oh, aww. How rude. Also just realized we're drawing the current texture within the double for loop, which isn't needed. So we'll take it out. Doesn't look any different, but there's no need to draw it that many times. But let's go ahead and update that current texture if we click on it. So in our mouse function, if we click on that area, let's increase the current texture by one. If it's over 20, reset to zero. So left click will cycle the textures forward. And let's add, if you right click on it, it will cycle the textures back. So there, left click forward and right click back. Next, we need a function to add that current texture to our array. We'll get the mouse position. We'll limit so you can't add outside the array. We want to check if the current map is zero. We'll let us know if we're adding to the wall array, the floor, or the ceiling array. And we'll add this right when the left mouse button is clicked down. And we've made the correction in the texture, so we no longer need to subtract one from the array. And we were doing something similar in the draw raise function. We don't need to subtract one from the vertical map or horizontal map. So now the current texture is exactly the texture that we're adding to the array. This is great, but you'll only add when you click the mouse down. I want to be able to add walls and drag the mouse. So you remember that we made a mouse moving function. We'll make sure that if you're not dragging any items, that you can right click and add textures as you move the mouse. I want to add a couple things to help me. You don't have to do this, but for me, if I press the Q button, I want to clear the current texture quickly to zero, so I don't have to scroll through all 20 textures. And if I press spacebar, I can return to the 2D edit mode. And it's working. We can right click to drag and draw walls. I can press Q to go to zero, which will subtract walls. All right, it's looking good so far. Let's keep it going. Hey, you know what would be really fun? What if we can add a bunch of enemies? We'll hold on to the number of sprites, add that to the array. When this enemy is created, I'm gonna add 32 to offset it so we don't draw over each other. We'll set their RGB value. We'll increase the array by one. So, okay, I'm gonna quickly draw some walls in here. And then we hit enemy, you can see them added in the upper left corner. We got three, let's add a few more. Perfect. Okay, that's 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 a lot. Uh, okay, this is too many. This is scary. Uh, this, is, this is legitimately scary. Okay, I'm, they are after me. Okay, this is a lot. Um, this is, it's, ah, <laughs> this is scary. Okay, this might be too many. I did not add a way to end this level, so they are just gonna kill me. Yep. So we need a way to end the level. So now let's check for a player position in the floor map array. If that map number is 20, and then that's a win for the level and you can set the next game state. All right, to test it, I'm just gonna draw some walls. I'm gonna draw that floor texture. So when we walk over it, there, that texture ID was 20, so it ended the level. 
We're going to want to save these levels, so let's keep track of our current level, set it to 1. So to save the level, this is the function that we need. I'm going to combine the file name with our current level number. We're going to open the file for writing. We'll use fprintf to save the map x and y dimensions. And this function won't run unless we call it within that first button that we clicked on. So I'll show you that the file doesn't exist until we click save. And there, you can see level underscore one. If I open it up, you can see our map array size. So this is how we're going to save out all the variables to our level. So let's just keep it going. We can now save the player's x and y position and angle, uh, the number of sprites, uh, a for loop to save those sprite variables. Uh, of course, we need the floor, the walls, and the ceiling. And we're making sure we keep track of float and integer values. And that's our save function. The load function is going to be very similar. We're only going to load in the current level. We're going to read the file. We're going to f scan f to read in the variables. We'll keep it the exact same that we saved it. The array dimensions, the player variables, the number of sprites, those sprite variables, uh, the walls, the floor, and the ceiling. And that's really everything we need to save for our level. And we'll call that load function on the load button. All right, I'm just going to draw something really quickly. I'm drawing the walls, I'm drawing the floors, the ceilings, I have the end texture, uh, I have a door, I have an enemy, I have a key. We're testing it all here. I'm going to go ahead and save this level as level 1, and then let's draw an 8x8 map for level 2. Alright, same thing, just going to quickly draw something, and I'm going to save it. So we have level 1 save, we have level 2 save. So in our display function, when we win a level, the timer is going to increase, and when it peaks, it jumps to the next game state. But we're going to have our current level increase, so we can go from level 1 to level 2 and beyond. Okay, so let's just put it all together. We'll load in level 1. We have our game screen. We have our key. We have our door. We have our enemy. Let's then go to the portal that ends this level. And boom, you won. And now it instantly loaded level 2. Pick up our key, our door, our enemy can kill us. We've got it all. We have enough to make a game. And there's actually so much more we can do. For instance, I made this game on the Game Boy Advance called Snow Tank. It's completely a raycaster. It's a third person perspective where the camera actually avoids wall collisions. There's particles. You can look up and down. Uh, there's projectiles. I even added animated cameras so you can, uh, you can make your own cutscene. Uh, you can do a lot with the Raycaster. We can really push this further if you want. Just let me know if you're interested. So thank you again for all the kind comments and support. And my favorite part is I can't wait to see what you guys make from this. I'm always inspired by your creativity and what you guys come up with. So thank you so much for watching this. Let's hang out again sometime and see you next time.